Senator Jim Carlson is the minority lead on the Senate State Government and Elections Committee. He joined me this week to talk about some of the DFL caucus proposals to protect and advance democracy. Some call it folklore, others say it's fact, but there's been a tradition over the last 20 years or so that any changes to election law be done in a bipartisan manner. Minnesota still retains divided government, but were it not so, would that tradition change? Has election policy become political? Well, for the last question first, yes, it has become so political and partisan and polar partisan. I would more than, I'd be more than happy if we could put some, some legislation together that uh, would, could be part bipartisan. And uh, I was here when Tim Pawlenty made that, that demand that it had to be bipartisan or he wouldn't sign it. And we did have some things that we could push through at the time. We've even had some during uh, Governor Dayton's time, but it got more and more polar. And today we have so much rhetoric that is surrounding elections that uh, has made it, pushed it even more polar. And so it, it is just not going to work anymore because the, the bills that one party has put out are so polar partisan and the bills that the other party has put out are polar. So at this point, um, I can't say that I can see it going back until maybe we have, and, and I believe me, when we have a non-divided government where we could have the minority party be part of our election reforms, that would be great. Um, the majority, which is Republican in the Senate, has included the implementation of provisional ballots in their omnibus state government budget bill. Uh, the Republicans are saying that 47 states have provisional ballots. What are your views on this? Well, we don't need provisional ballots. And in fact, it's the, uh, the election. There's a, an organization that uh, requires you to have a mechanism that allows same day registration or provisional ballots. And we have same day registration. And in fact, uh, Indiana had provisional ballots and it caused them no end of problems. But once they added same day registration, then provisional ballots are really unnecessary and they met the federal code. We meet the federal requirements by having same day registration. And what, what we're doing now is we're proposing to have provisional ballots that actually aren't counted on election day. And that makes it so that uh, we're gonna have a lot of confusion where people are gonna expect their vote to be counted on election day they moved in the last year and they come in to uh, vote and they can register, they can still register, but they have to fill out a provisional ballot that still has to be so-called cured before it can be counted. So it's, uh, it's a major change. And what uh, the nationally, the, the uh, uh, federal elections people in N NCSL, that's the National Council of State Legislators, uh, they have uh, done a study between 20, uh, let's see, 2006 and 2016, they found that only 30%, uh, I'm sorry, 30% were not counted. So about 60 some percent of the voters said, what's this? I don't know how to do it. I'm not gonna bother. I only voted for my, my president and for no one else. And so I'm just gonna let it go. And so what happens is that the participation just drops like a rock. And uh, I don't know what it would be for the first year we would have provisional ballots, but what these uh, expert organizations predict is that it's somewhere between three and 7% drop in participation just because of provisional ballots. And Minnesota is known, Minnesota is known for its voter turnout. Exactly, we are number one again. <laughs> One of the changes that your caucus is promoting is automatic voter registration whenever a person interacts with state services, like a driver's license application or an application for Minsure. Why is this a good idea? Well, one thing is that, you know, we always have this issue of getting people registered. And, you know, we don't mandate it. You know, it's not like uh, selective service. Well, when you have to turn eight, when you turn 18, you have to register. Uh, it's purely voluntary. And we say it's voluntary to not register. And we have tried to do something called, uh, and this has been the 13 years I've been in the Senate, try to get what we call an opt out onto your driver's license. We have an opt in. 
If you fill out your driver's license because you're renewing it or changing your residence, there's a little box that you check. And that means that, you can, that you're asking to be registered at the same time. And that saves a lot of issues and also gets you into the uh, voter registration system with an accurate address, uh, accurate name, accurate uh, birth date, all that sort of thing. And it just makes it a lot easier for people to, be, to participate. And we also would like to have automatic voter registration for 16 year olds, because when they get their driver's license, that's a big deal. It's a very big deal the first time that you actually apply for your driver's license. And we want voting to be a big deal. We want people to actually look forward to being able to vote. And when you're 16, I'm sorry, let me back up. When you're 17, you can pre-register as long as you turn 18 before the next general election. So why not move that to 16? pre-register, and then the system keeps you off of the voter rolls until you turn 18, and then you automatically go on to the voter rolls. And that will get young people more interested. There's nothing better for our future than to have young people participate in their government as soon as they can. So that's why I'm strongly for that. Under current law, a felon's voting rights are not restored until after their entire sentence is completed, which can include probation, parole, or supervised release. Uh, states run the gamut on this issue with states like Maine and Vermont never taking away voting rights. Uh, others like Iowa and Kentucky never restore voting rights. Why should Minnesota make the change that would allow um, a felon's voting rights to be reinstated upon completion of incarceration? Well, the first thing I have to say about that is that uh, taking away voter rights was actually something that came from the Jim Crow laws where people, um, especially African-American, would be convicted of crimes and then have their voting rights taken away. And some, some of those states don't, bring, don't take them back. Um, and in also another issue that we have is that when we talk about voter irregularities or voter, not fraud, but in, um, ineligible voters, many times we're talking about those people. And you mentioned that it's after incarceration after prohibition, uh, probation and after parole. And we call that being on paper. And many of the, uh, the voters that get caught at that didn't know that they couldn't vote. And they, you know, in, to be guilty of a felony, you have to knowingly vote. So there's a problem there with uh, county attorneys having to prove that this person knowingly voted when they, they should have known that they were not eligible. And that is clogging up a lot of our uh, county attorney work in, in my county, Dakota County, it was more than half of the people that were recommended for investigation were actually eligible to vote because they just didn't know that they couldn't. I'm sorry, they weren't eligible, but they didn't know that they couldn't vote. Or there were some cases where they were actually eligible, but it, that had not gotten taken off of the challenged voter list. So there's too many errors for that. And also I think that people should be voting and it has shown that there's a, a quite a dramatic decrease in um, what we call recidivism, where somebody will say, I am now part of the society, I can vote. And so I'm not going to lose my rights to vote again. So I, I'm not gonna do another felony or at least I'm not gonna get caught doing one. Uh, we just have just a few moments left, but I'd like you, if you could be quick, what came out of this COVID-19, this last election, what changes were made to accommodate the pandemic that you would like to see remain permanent? Big thing probably is early voting uh, without excuse and mail-in voting. We authorized a lot of mail-in voting. Today, uh, there are about a thousand precincts across Minnesota that can do mail-in voting. If you take Senate District 1, there are a hundred and I believe it's a hundred and seventy-eight precincts in that district. Of those 178, only 40 cannot vote by mail-in. The others all can. So there's a thousand precincts across Minnesota that can vote by mail. None in the Twin City area. The seven county Twin City area is prohibited from having mail-in voting. And I think uh, you know, I have a daughter that lives in California where they have it. I have a son that lives in the state of Washington that have it. 
and they just can't figure out why we don't have mail-in voting. Senator so Jim Carlson, we, 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 have to, we have to end there, but thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Shannon. This is just incredible that we can have this conversation and get the information out to people. Joys of technology. Yes. <laughs>